Romania seems to have been, uh, uh, to have left a very modest legacy also in the sense of uh, the lack of interest in this issue in the current <coughs> generation. But in 2018, uh, just a few hundred meters away from here, there are various uh, contemporary forms of uh, 1968 in 2018. So there is pretty much the same combination of counterculture with ideology in a relatively confusing combination and of course with some utopia. I still didn't manage to get which utopia would that be, but in any case we are looking forward to the crystallization of their utopia. We know that some counterculture revives in the uh, in these uh, uh, demonstrations, and maybe, uh, given time, uh, there will be a way to, to, to formulate the utopia. Today we uh, have a discussion that uh, is a kind of coda to the uh, colloquium we had in Sinaya on the same topic, 1968, counterculture ideology utopia. And some of the participants in that uh, colloquium are here uh, with us tonight. And we would like to do a kind of, uh, well, let's say final take on the, on the topic which kept us busy for three days out there in the mountains. Um, and I would like to introduce Professor Gregory Clays from Royal Holloway, the University of London. Uh, I'll introduce them in the order of their sitting. Uh, with Gregory Clays, we started the whole program, uh, Ideas in the Agora, uh, one year ago, with a uh, discussion of Marx. Now, one of the side effects of his interest in, uh, uh, in Marx is this book, Marx and Marxism, which was just published, um, which, in fact, uh, is a synthesis also not only of the problem but of the posterity of the legacy of Marx and Marxism in countries around the world. Um, then we have Bogdan Giu, who in Romania doesn't need any form of uh, introduction, but uh, overseas it, he may need. A, uh, he started as a poet. I never anticipated his uh, prophetic realism, I think, from time to time his extraordinary uh, career after 1989 or after 1990, when he emerged as one of the most important uh, uh, public intellectuals, translators from French. If you want the, a dream list of, uh, of the best in French theory, uh, Bogdan Gil has translated them all uh, into Romanian. He has written also extensively on everything that has to do with public culture, and high culture uh, in Romania and around Europe. A very a person very interested in the arts as well, in the visual arts. A permanent presence in our cultural periodicals, as he is in publishing houses and in uh, uh, everywhere else in, in Europe, not just in France. Um, Professor Gabor Klanitsa from uh, Central European University in uh, Budapest, as you can find also in the, uh, the leaflet of uh, this uh, evening. Uh, is a specialist in medieval studies, a reputed, uh, internationally reputed uh, historian of, uh, of all the things that we would like to know better, from witchcraft to uh, the cult of saints uh, on Catholic terrain in Hungary, but also everywhere in the world. But he also, funnily enough, he is also a, a man of his, uh, of his time or of our time, and he's interested in popular culture, counterculture of the 1968 period and uh, then, uh, since, since then. Uh, here we have um, uh, Professor uh, Balas Tenchengi, also from Central European University, one of the leading uh, historians of political thought uh, for the entire area of Central Eastern Europe. Uh, as he speaks all the languages of the area and knows all the cultures of the area, he's quite perfectly qualified to discuss these uh, cultures and ideas in, uh, in, uh, in depth. He also knows Romanian, so you can address him in Romanian if you want. Um, 
Then uh, Professor Daniel Barbo, who has been recently a guest of this series. Uh, again, he doesn't need uh, any introduction in Romania. He has written extensively on a variety of topics stemming from uh, his original interest in art history, history of the Nautalité, cultural history, all the way up to uh, political theory, political science. He actually established the Faculty of Political Science at the University of Bucharest after, well, when it was possible, that is, after 1990. Um, Professor Clay is also uh, at this uh, colloquium in Sinaia. He uh, received the Cantemir Prize, something that we established years ago in Oxford, and then we continue to award. Um, this time it was the fifth uh, Cantemir Award. So this is, we'll start in the following way. I'll ask first uh, Professor Place to, to start and give us an overview of the mostly the let's say the countercultural part of this uh, uh, nexus, countercultural ideology you talk about. So Greg, you have the floor. So thank you very much for that kind introduction, Soren, first of all, and welcome to all of you uh, for turning out at this event instead of going to the rather more glamorous demonstration down the road. Uh, as Soren suggested, I've been delegated to tackle only the countercultural side of 1968, which is in most respects, although one can debate this, explicitly anti-political. So it's the kind of alter ego of the experience of 1968. And by and large, I'm quite conscious now of speaking here in Bucharest, the impact of the counterculture upon the general trends, the mentality, the experience of people who participated in all of the events of 1968 is in proportion to the distance that you uh, physically are from California, which is the epicenter of the origins of the countercultural movement. So if you're in Bucharest, or even more if you're in Moscow, you experience relatively little of many of the most important trends which are evident in the United States and to uh, a greater degree in Western Europe and Britain and so on. So I want to make a, a couple of claims and to offer a question to you and I think to us collectively about the nature of this countercultural experience, which of course has had now uh, an impact upon all of our lives, has indisputably transformed our morals, our mores, our ways of interacting with one another, even in ways which are not entirely transparent now, but which looking back over 50 years are, I think, quite obvious, particularly to the older generation. So first of all, it's very clear that this is a generational revolt. This is the first moment when, at least in the West, but this includes large parts of the East, there's the consciousness of belonging to a particular generation and, although it had happened in the past, expounding an ideal of youth, even a cult of youth, uh, which gives the sense of being young and the immediacy of that uh, experience a kind of priority in everyone's lives. This is, of course, in different countries, experienced in a different way. The sense of antagonism to the generation of the parents, for example, in Germany is mediated by the experience of the Second World War and the necessity of confronting in the generation of the parents what you did under the Fuhrer. Uh, in the United States, it's a completely different issue, but yet the antagonism within the family is still very much there. It's necessary, of course, to have this contradiction in order to define the identity of youth as a group. And group psychology is of enormous importance in all of this. So secondly, then, we might say that this appears as just another albeit very important, instance of subcultural development. Uh, sociologists would begin to classify it in this way. But yet, on the other hand, of course, it purports to represent a challenge going to the roots of the mainstream culture. In this case, a capitalist culture, the antagonism quite consciously in the United States, for example, or in Britain, is with the bourgeois middle class conventions of the parents' generation. And this is explicitly, in the counterculture, a rejection of many, if not all, of those conventions. But then here comes the twist, of course. 
middle-class American life in the 1950s, where the roots in bohemianism and so on uh, of disaffection are already present before we reach the critical summer of love, 1966, passing, uh, 1967, excuse me, passing then through two years to the Woodstock Festival of 1969. It's a relatively brief explosion in this sense. Uh, this is uh, already then, an, uh, in a kind of vague way, an anti-capitalist movement, but there's not a politicization of this term. It's rejection of the values of American middle class life, which of course uh, are the values of the most affluent society that has ever existed beforehand. So here's the paradox. This is the most privileged generation that has ever existed, and yet they want to rebel against their parents. But yet, and here's the most interesting, intriguing twist in the paradox, they rebel in the name of a hedonism, which is precisely the principal value of the generation of their parents. So here we have then the, the real paradox here. Is this a counterculture, uh, or is it by virtue of embracing the same central principle, hedonism, the pursuit of happiness, is it in fact just an extension of the principal values of the ge generation of their parents? In which case, when we begin to see co-optation uh, occurring, the, this, the counterculture is co-opted extremely quickly into the mainstream culture, commodified and so on, uh, then this explains why this process of co-optation occurs just as easily as it does. So, there are five components. I don't have time to unpack them here, but I would just say a, a little bit about them. The first is uh, that this counterculture is clearly Dionysiac. That's to say it embraces a kind of revelry, uh, which uh, periodically occurs, of course, throughout Western culture. The cult of the festival is a well-known uh, part of all traditions in all parts of the world, but it is embraced with a fervor a vehemence and enthusiasm, which is virtually unparalleled outside, interestingly enough, of the great religious awakenings which occur in, in American history even before the United States, the late 18th century, and so on. Uh, there are several uh, new forms that this Dionysiac uh, experience assumes. The single most important, of course, is the use of drugs, especially cannabis or marijuana, which is central to the experience of the Summer of Love, 1967, is one of the key dividing lines, the heads, the smokers of marijuana, or pot as it's called, uh, against their parents' generation, the juicers, those who use alcohol as a form of stimulation and intoxication. And the difference in the types of intoxication that marijuana produces as opposed to alcohol is one of the central lines of fissure in the entire juxtaposition of the outlook of the new generation to that of their parents' generation. So secondly then, there's clearly overlapping with this a sense of the revival of spirituality. You'll all be aware of the idea of the age of Aquarius. Uh, this is the dawning of a new kind of mentality uh, which embraces a kind of, I'm using the phraseology of the period, a kind of cosmic consciousness, an insight into the nature of reality, which, for example, a generation which intoxicates itself through alcohol has never been able to perceive because it blinds itself by stupefying itself with uh, a drug, which alcohol, of course, also is after a fashion, uh, which uh, prohibits the deeper perception as the users of, uh, especially now, uh, the psychedelic drugs, mescaline, psilocybin, LSD, claim that they possess a unique kind of insight into the universe. So this, of course, is also, if one looks at the longer term historical parallels, this is in keeping with various traditions of mysticism where self-induced uh, intoxication of various kinds is there for many, many centuries, of course, beforehand. So thirdly, then, there is, but it's a minor undertone in this process, not embraced by the majority of those who even self-identify as being part of the counterculture, there's a revolt against urban life, uh, an embracing of simplicity, a back to nature, primitivism, uh, tune in, uh, turn on, drop out, 
go back to the countryside, live in a rural commune, not an urban commune by and large, but a rural commune. Uh, this again has many trends historically, of course, the appeal to simplicity. Usually every second or third generation, this arises to the surface, sometimes among students, sometimes amongst other groups, and there's a revolt against, again, bourgeois conventionalism, which assumes this form. Fourthly, there is a form of American individualism which now verges onto what some sociologists, cultural critics, and so on today associate with, in fact, the dominant motif of the whole of the modern period from slightly before the mid-1960s right up to the present day. That is to say, the eliding or transformation of various forms of individualism into narcissism. The worship of the body, the worship of the sense of the creative self, the worship of the body. This has now, I'm posing this here initially as a development of individualism, but it has, of course, a sociable component as well. The counterculture is, in many respects, intensely a sociable experience. When you go to a festival, you don't go to sit there in your drug-induced haze listening to the music, which is transforming your inner self. You also go there to be with other people sharing the same experience. That's what such festivals have always been about throughout history. And you're there with people you can trust. You're there with people you can identify with. You can lower your guard. This is the new idea of sociability. So when you meet somebody with long hair on the street or when you're standing on the highway with your thumb outstretched hitchhiking and a Volkswagen van pulls up, painted in day glow colors with flowers on the outside, uh, you all know you're part of the same human family, except the people you're revolting against are not a part of this family, of course. They are still the antagonists. So this brings about, of course, the expressive, romantic, colorful side of the cultural revolt that the counterculture represents. Long hair for men and women alike, blending of gender identity, very important part of this experience, which still remains with us in many respects. Use of colorful clothing and adornment for men and women alike. All of this mm, integrated quite quickly by the early 1970s into the mainstream culture. But this is what most people then remember from this period. So, two things to conclude. First of all, the general results of all this, looking backwards now, 50 years later. Uh, clearly a relaxation of morals across the generations. People find it easier once they have shed what seemed to be a quite frigid artificiality of social interaction in the 1950s. People find it much easier to actually get along with each other in the generations that come. This is a major achievement, which is often not noted, but which I think uh, constitutes a very important part of this process. Then, of course, by the 1970s, the movement which seems to constitute itself as a single counterculture in the late 60s begins to splinter and to proliferate into single issue movements, all of which are very relevant today. The most important of these is feminism, definitely not center stage in 1968 by any stretch of the imagination. Women still regarded as essentially peripheral to the movement, even though sexual liberation, of course, is supposed to be good for both men and women. And the birth control pill, of course, is central to this entire uh, uh, sense of ecstatic experience. But actually, women don't enjoy anything like the same rights within this movement. They're not accorded the same status. So finally then, let's come back to the, the main question that I asked at the, the outset here. Does this represent a genuine rebellion against bourgeois, particularly consumer-oriented culture? This was the idea of the this idealized American family of the 1950s with the technologically most advanced kitchen, all the mod comms, so to speak, the air conditioner, the uh, newest stove and uh, vacuum cleaners and so on, which made life so much easier uh, than beforehand. Is this a rejection of this society or is it in fact an extension of the hedonism that results from allowing these machines to give us free time. 
because what do we do with all this new machinery? Of course, we enjoy our lives. And the United States, of course, first and foremost paradigmatically here, is the society founded upon this idea of hedonism in this period. So we're left with a very stark question, which I think the reception of the counterculture in the 70s, 80s, and afterwards sheds interesting light on. Is this a genuine revolt? Uh, not merely generational, but a revolt which goes to the core values of the society? Or is it merely an extension of the main ideal of the preceding society? So, uh, spoiler alert here, and I will stop with this observation. Uh, I think, of course, it's a bit of both. Academics have to sit on the fence and say, yes, this, and yes, that, and no, this, and no, that. Uh, in some senses, particularly in the rejection of consumer culture, this Countercultural revolt represents an extremely important trend for the 21st century. We're now facing in the next 40, 50 years the prospect of the destruction of the planet through the destruction of its environment. We have to garner and create a new conception of consumption which involves producing goods which uh, last much longer, which involves much less conspicuous consumption, producing goods merely to impress our neighbors buying the latest luxury cars and luxury everything just to impress other people rather than needing to desire these goods. This new mentality that we, I can prophesy because I'll be safely long since underground by then, will emerge in the middle of this century, will probably see itself as owing much to this generation that I've just discussed. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. My, I would like to comment on this very quickly on just a few aspects. One the distance from the epicenter. The distance from the epicenter creates a kind of symbolic geography of, uh, or a, gr a civilizational gradient, if you want, of uh, ever more distant forms, ever more, let's say, uh, adulterated, uh, mixed uh, with various local ingredients of the original core. That's one thing. So distance creates uh, both um, or shared geographical space, both creates uh, or enhances distances at the conceptual, aesthetic, human existential level, that's clear. But it also creates a kind of <clears throat> added frenzy, added passion to identify with all those things that happen elsewhere, which you cannot live in any other way but vicariously. Mm -hmm. They are out there, there is a certain self-identification which is uh, at times, what well, can be, has been, we know Gabor Khan is going to talk about this, uh, which can uh, have an added uh, passionate dimension which is of course lacking in the original uh, uh, core because there you then, uh, well the repressive forces are not that repressive after all if you compare them to the to their counterparts in Eastern Europe. So it's, you can just uh, laugh a little bit uh, uh, nostalgically at that. Uh, so that's one thing. There is a kind of added pa passion of those who cannot live this other than vicariously, more aesthetically, less existentially, more intellectually. And thus it creates a certain variation uh, which is also has its own uh, uh, interest and I think uh, because in countries, depending on the local context, in countries that are neighboring, such as Hungary and Romania, you find vastly different forms of uh, counterculture if you only take that around 1968. Uh, and not everything can be explained by in terms of distance, because the distance, after all, is not, is not so big. And the exposure to uh, those ingredients coming from California or from Paris, is ultimately uh, almost the same. But there are local uh, 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 contexts that differ enormously. A, and these uh, differences do not, cannot all be traced to 1968. Some of that uh, uh, is superimposed over older uh, symbolic geographies and cultural civilizational gradients. So somehow, uh, if one does this general map of, uh, of 1968, again as, a, as an abstract notion uh, to describe, to encapsulate everything that happened, uh, one gets a kind of diversity 
uh, opposed. And once again, I, I once proposed this notion of geocultural bovarism. I live here, but I dream uh, about living there, and I even believe it. And I add a, a, a kind of uh, uh, energy to that, which is lacking in the normal original form. With this, uh, I would like to ask uh, Gabor Planitsai to, to, to um, tell us what was going on mostly in Eastern Europe. Of course, in 1968, he was a, 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 a schoolboy in Paris at, uh, nine, at 18. Uh, he was there uh, studying in Paris. He could see uh, up close what was going on in the streets of Paris. But he also knew that he was from Hungary and he knew other things that the French revolutionaries of 1968 did not know. So, Gabo. Thank you. Well, that would be exaggeration that I knew too much. But uh, actually, I, uh, I knew about what was happening uh, in France. Uh, I knew about what was happening also in Czechoslovakia. And, uh, uh, coming from Hungary to France and to, uh, so, 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 so to say, welfare society, it took some uh, uh, time until I really understood uh, how that word which we were dreaming about was something uh, that could be hated to such an extent and uh, 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 crashed to pieces. Uh, so I had to understand uh, that politics uh, was was elsewhere also, and uh, this is one thing which uh, uh, which I learned that uh, that there is a politics not only in po in the politics, uh, there is, but there is repression and authority at school, uh, uh, in the street, in the way you dress, in the way you are obliged to behave, and and so on. So, so I think that uh, that is something which uh, is. Uh, uh, is, was not so evident for me uh, when I went there. But then, uh, uh, as a historian, when I look, I look back uh, to uh, what was uh, in the East. Uh, basically, uh, uh, basically, similar problems uh, were uh, perceived by the young people, and similar uh, also uh, desires and similar type of rebellion. So, if we just take the youth culture. And that is uh, the subject with which I was a little bit uh, dealing with. And with Balash Trencheni, we, we've been uh, doing seminars on youth countercultures in comparatively in the Eastern countries. It was that uh, uh, indeed uh, uh, that same uh, uh, same uh, problem uh, with the ge youth generation, that type of rebellion, was uh, uh, behind all, all these things. Now uh, I would. Uh, uh, Add uh, to this very very uh, good panorama uh, just uh, two uh, things which uh, might be interesting for uh, considering East European uh, uh, countercultures, uh, uh, which were of course uh, uh, of course a, a counterculture uh, that was uh, very much dependent on that distance, uh, on that distance and that uh, strong desire to. Uh, to discover uh, and to realize uh, the same experience in a condition uh, much worse, much more unfavorable. Yet, uh, uh, this counterculture provided a scheme. So we could go out from the city, we could go to Lake Balaton in Hungary, or we could, uh, uh, the rock bands were forming just as well in the outskirts, and we understood very well uh, how uh, that type of thing was the same way underground. and. Uh, the same way under that type of pressure uh, uh, against which there has to, had to be a resistance. So there were conditions uh, which were uh, on the one hand uh, 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 similar, on the other hand uh, uh, conditioned by a, a, a larger uh, uh, amount of cultural and political control and also uh, uh, a larger amount of deprivation of means to realize that type of counterculture. So uh, we shouldn't uh, forget that, of course, we've been hitchhiking also, we, uh, but the first uh, genes that somebody could get, uh, I think many people know uh, this experience, that uh, it came from Western uh, relatives, emigres, and then uh, if, if there was one, uh, one genes that was such a treasure, uh, such, and such a, an item of prestige, and, uh, and uh, there was, for example, in 1963, so we're just before uh, uh, 68 it started, there was a 
hooligan uh, 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 meeting. Uh, hooligans were the Eastern, uh, the mostly Soviet, but then also Hungarian designation of this uh, unruly youth uh, uh, meeting at, at Lake Balaton. And uh, the police uh, considered this, and the secret police was uh, monitoring and considered this as something. Uh, Post-1956, Hungary was very sensitive of any type of meeting of people, especially young. Uh, so they took off uh, the, uh, the hooligans from the, uh, who were in jeans, uh, from the trains, and they were uh, tearing open or cutting up their jeans. So that was just... Uh, uh, this was done in the streets of Bucharest and the world town in Romania. Destroying, and, uh, and, 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 and they were weeping. That was their greatest treasure, and they knew it. Uh, the other thing was uh, long hair that uh, youth was uh, a <laughs> yeah well, the, the the mini skirts were not causing so much scandal in hungary but uh, <laughs> long... the policemen were more <laughs> let's say favorable to that uh, and it, it was not really counterculture in in so it was a little bit before and uh, of course, uh, uh, at school, for example, and that was uh, also a realization, the, the repression uh, of uh, women uh, or the girls couldn't go in trousers uh, and uh, the boys were taken to the barber shop to get their hair cut. This was a, a, such a brutal thing that, of course, continued with the military service and other things. But what I, where I want to get at that uh, this uh, uh, situation was similar, but a little bit different at the same time. And the other, uh, uh, the other aspect which uh, I would uh, say is that uh, this type of uh, uh, new type of culture, that refusal of uh, consumer uh, uh, society, that was a little bit there in Hungary, for example, in around 1968, there was a so-called new economic mechanism, and there was the frigider socialism, as they said, and uh, it started. It started, but I wouldn't say that there was such a strong and powerful drive for the young to uh, turn the, uh, their back upon this. Rather, they understood uh, this as a general cultural uh, behavioral pattern. But uh, this had uh, some other uh, dimensions. One dimension was to uh, have a kind of uh, uh, local uh, identity uh, uh, relating to uh, something uh, local cultural goods. So uh, uh, the, from the part of Hungarians, uh, discovery of Transylvanian dance houses. That was a countercultural thing, also uh, considered to be a dangerous uh, manifestation of nationalism. and. Uh, persecuted uh, in, in various ways, but that was something uh, which was uh, turning the back to the official mainstream uh, uh, and the state uh, uh, monitored because the state discovered the Hungarian youth organization that some of the uh, beat bands can be very well used to pacify this type of desire of being different, but then, uh, uh, then the counterculture and uh, more rebellious uh, uh, youth was uh, trying to create something which could be called uh, underground. And this underground uh, had a, a, a very, a, a very uh, interesting undertone in, in, in Hungary. This was the period when uh, underground passages were cons uh, constructed in Budapest, for example. And uh, Kadar was just... Uh, 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 referring to that, that socialism is not be being built in the underground, uh, uh, but it was this out there in the sun. Uh, sun and then uh, this, uh, but underground, uh, underground meant also uh, 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 from the point of view of political culture and uh, and uh, this cultural or cultural uh, manifestations of the counterculture to be outside of the zone uh, which is monitored uh, by the police, by the uh, state institutions, by uh, official things, because uh, these concerts were in the outskirts, we uh, were in very, uh, uh, very uh, remote clubs, but so underground and marginal. And this started to create a pattern. Now, let me mention here, since we're talking about, uh, uh, about uh, counterculture, Herbert Marcuse in California, Essay on Liberation, uh, was uh, speaking uh, precisely about uh, the problem of uh, that the uh, renewal will be coming from the margins, from below or from the margins, or from the uh, weekend. This is uh, something which we did not have so much in Hungary uh, and in uh, Central Europe, the 
uh, uh, third world uh, appearance, all the extra European things, but there were certain things. The Roma, for example, were also present, and there were uh, uh, countercultural uh, uh, openings into that direction. And it was also uh, very, uh, uh, always uh, uh, very uh, interesting to, uh, to see a kind of exchange between uh, uh, these East European countries, which uh, could uh, 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 communicate much better behind the, uh, uh, we had less possibilities to travel, but uh, we could go to Poland, we could go to Prague, we could go uh, to Transylvania, we could uh, go to uh, Yugoslavia was a little bit of a promised land, and there is a special uh, uh, function that they were mediating a lot, and uh, this type of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, exchange uh, was uh, allowing uh, these uh, East European countercultures uh, to thrive. Thank you, uh, Gabor Tarenzai. There is another thing that is already present in this description of the uh, say yeah. regional transnational exchange yeah, yeah, yeah. of originally countercultural, almost exclusively countercultural uh, ideas or fashions or fads. Underneath, there is something that emerges, and that is ideas of a political alternative that uh, travel across uh, uh, borders, uh, cultural uh, boundaries um, in various ways, but somehow they make up uh, together a kind of preface to uh, a political dimension that was to be developed a little bit later. So uh, one could safely say that uh, there is something that was taken up from counter, from counter culture in the area, and uh, transformed into a more political uh, consciousness later. And uh, in many ways, the, the first contacts at the level of counterculture and of uh, youth tourism and the youth festivals, uh, cinema, and, uh, visual arts, and so forth, throughout Central and Eastern Europe, sometimes, in most of the time, in association with Western European uh, imports. Uh, in the open were uh, hidden, uh, smuggled into the country, but with that circulated a certain new air that uh, in Prague became obvious already in 1968, uh, because it was precipitated, it was also made visible by the Soviet invasion. So the political dimension of this counterculture which existed everywhere became a political and radically political to resist the force coming from the outside. And in this process, you can say that in the Prague Spring, uh, counterculture and uh, political alternatives meet uh, in, let's say, an almost uh, uh, radical form. And then there is a way in which they uh, support each other. And probably, if we look then at the continuation in the 1970s and 80s, we see these threads. Uh, of the counterculture, ideology, and politics coming together at times. Sometimes it's the same people who do uh, countercultural gestures, not necessarily rock bands, but other forms of counterculture in poetry, in literature, in philosophy, of course, who then emerge as uh, political thinkers, political leaders. You have to look into that uh, uh, generation that is wearing jeans gets its genes cut uh, at 16, 17, then you see that out of that, uh, let's say, part of the population, something else emerges over time. And uh, that is ideas of a political alternative, utopian in general, unrealistic, very much like the, uh, this, as I said in Sinai, this obsession with the cancellation of what is negative, the refusal, the absolute refusal of negativity, of pretending that now il est interdit d'interdire and all these uh, slogans, they existed in very form, various forms also in the area. So I will turn then to, to uh, Borash Tenchengi and ask him to give us a certain uh, view of these Central Eastern European uh, movements of ideas at the time, around 1968 and so forth. 
Yeah, I, I, I wanted to start with that, but I, I think after Gregory's uh, uh, talk, I so that I will say a couple of things still about the cultural uh, and the political right, yeah. and the interaction of the two. But because I think we should be very clear that the this there is this distance question, but at the same time we should be very clear, and I think it's very important when you look at historic political thought and historic cultural thought as well that this is not a deficient West. Yes, yeah? so like the East is not just yeah 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 it's lack of that, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, that life is elsewhere because like what you have is very interesting actually configuration of uh, of sometimes this kind of hybrid projects, but sometimes actually having local cultural resources which are actually yeah. twisting this reception. To this, just I wanted to say something. There is a dimension which is the memory of these movements. In 1968 in Central and Eastern Europe has a deeper cultural memory than I, I think we can, uh, uh, in any case in California or in Nevada, because there are even aesthetic, uh, uh, political, even spiritualist. These things are not, in many ways, 1968 is a revival, is a rediscovery, but not in the situation where the memory was lost. Yeah. It's a revival uh, in situations where the memory of the 1930s is rather strong, the end of the 19th century. So in this, I think we differ quite a bit from, obviously from the United States. So, so what, I, what I thought is that there is a beautiful symbol uh, made in, in a film uh, by a Hungarian filmmaker called Gyula Gazda, that was uh, actually inspired by Czech New Wave and, and also Godard. He makes a film in 69, I think, which is called The Whistling Cobblestone. And this is basically a kind of improvised film with students from secondary school who are taken to this kind of socialist building camp like they are supposed to do some agricultural work but there is no real work to be done and they kind of go into like it which was of course reflecting very nicely Hungary in 69 then they go to the private peasants and they do, do work for the private peasants for real money and they get penalized by the the regime because the regime wants real socialist building which doesn't take place and then they revolt and and it becomes this kind of very nice uh, Hungarian version of the 68 experience and shows of course very nicely how different it is i mean they are actually opting for liberal uh, market economy in exchange for uh, uh, in exchange for this virtual socialist economy and there is one scene in and this is the whistling cobblestone that there is a scene of a french guest who is some relative of one guy coming with a small citroen uh, uh, to, to the camp and kind of tries to show like be friends with the Hungarian students, and he is actually bringing this kind of souvenir from Paris, which is this kind of like plastic cobblestone, and if you push it, it's whistling, and it's a kind of toy. And and for the Hung and it's a beautiful kind of metaphor in the film that that for us, like by the time we learn about Paris, it's already a commodified souvenir, and actually we have our own revolt, which has completely different stakes. Even though we know about them, they don't know about us. Yes, and and I think it shows very well this kind of relative distance that it's not just a kind of deficiency, it's not just a kind of hybridization. So it seems after okay. inventing the Hungarian orange, exactly. they uh, moved on to so, construction materials. Yes. And and I think. That, that is very important because I think then if you take it from this perspective, the 68, funnily enough, and I mean, I'm drawing on a project we were doing for like 10 years about history of East Central European political thought and trying to kind of write a long durée narrative about this, that, that actually 68 fits beautifully into a kind of pre-existing pattern of synchronization, not so much in the yes. uh, um, uh, Lovinescuian uh, sense, but, but actually in the sense that you have this kind of moments when East Central European cultural elites are actually trying to catch up. And they, this happens in 1848, this happens in the late 19th century, this happens in 1918 with the Wilsonian moment, this happens in a sad way with Nazi modernism in the late uh, 1930s, when that is the catching up moment, this happens in a way in 1945, and this happens in 68, and then will happen in 89, and maybe now once again in a not very uh, pleasant way. And that actually creates this kind of very quick learning curve and all the kind of long durée uh, uh, um, kind of temporalities are kind of squeezed. And I think you can read it through Kozelek and like whatever this kind of asynchronicity of synchronous that all of a sudden the, uh, in one moment all the kind of uh, context that in other uh, societies are actually built on some sort of historical sequence are actually cramped together. You have uh, uh, you have punk and post-punk in the same moment. You have uh, hippies and uh, uh, basically liberal democrats at the same time. Yes, and 
sometimes the same guys are hippies and liberal democrats uh, and 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 so on and i think this if you take this per, from this perspective then i think i think it gives a certain kind of twist to how to read uh, uh, 68 and then then of course just to give you a couple of uh, let's say comparative and uh, regional uh, frames for for this i mean like of course there is a local prehistory i mean there's a long durée local prehistory which i mentioned but there's also funny local prehistory for example if you look at the russian stilyaga uh, phenomenon yes which is a kind of proto hippie culture after the second world war which is existing in this kind of very interesting uh, 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 kind of americanized counter culture of young russian uh, guys who are actually getting to rush American objects because of the end of the, uh, the war when American commodified objects are actually coming to the Soviet Union for a very short time and these become this kind of cult of objects and then it's kind of broken but the memory of this is there. The second thing is that after 1956 there is this kind of return in most of these countries to the interwar avant-garde cultural traditions and also to some of the suppressed modernist cultural uh, specificities of local cultures. For example, I, for me it was extremely shocking to see that 1957, so as soon as it is possible, uh, Polish filmmakers are shooting experimental cinema like Stan, Stan Brakic, all of a sudden from realism they shift into kind of, you know, Jackson Pollockian, completely non-figurative avant-garde films uh, for children, by the way, because that was easier to shoot for children than for adults. And they are shooting psychedelic jazz concerts, yes? Krzysztof Komeda in 57 performs in psychedelic, uh, uh, with psychedelic jazz way before this is actually an American thing, yes? So I mean, yeah, like but, uh, a, a bigger uh, uh, comment I had a bigger market than most jazzmen in America yeah. goes doing yeah. uh, music for the best or the uh, films Polish films. Yeah, so exactly. Most but, but, of the music, uh, film music in Poland is done by comment. So, so and you have this cosmic spatial representation and everything, and this is completely local. I mean, like it is not copying American patterns. It is is rooted in Polish futuristic traditions. It is rooted in this kind of wartime Polish alternative underground actually culture and then it comes back as soon as it is possible to come back that is 1957 as soon as uh, there is a liberalization and then then uh, just give you two more issues i mean uh, uh, along these lines i mean like the whole problematization of youth yes i mean of course this is on the one hand the cultural transfer i mean we all know now that you know, Rorschach and all this stuff was read by party, actually by the party experts, and they were kind of reading all this literature about, uh, you know, uh, American counterculture. But then they were also bloody interested in their own views, uh, uh, because they realized that they can't talk to them. And that is not by chance. I mean, once again, if you look at Wojda's films, I mean, Tibulski's icon is showing this perfectly well. Like, there are these films that he's showing that, you know, there are the young guys, and there is this guy who was during the Second World War a kind of hero, and the hero is trying to, you know, have some kind of emotional relationship with some girls from the younger generation. And there's completely no way, because like he is representing, he's all the pathos that he talks about, revolution, uh, uh, you know, resistance, war, war. whatever, is completely irrelevant for the guys who are like 10 years younger, yes? And then there's this beautiful scene of like Tsibuski kind of like half blind, walking on the snow, like out, uh, because he, he cannot handle basically this, this cleavage. So I think these systems were actually extremely uh, focused on the use, uh, the cleavage, the generational cleavage, and this is not happening in 68, this is happening in 61, 62, and they are already importing, actually, American social psychology yes. in all these countries. I mean, we have, I have a Romanian uh, PhD student, Adela Hunku, who is now doing this research. I mean, she is finding that in 61, 62, all the Romanian and Hungarian and Czech and whatever parties are sending their best young sociologists to America, to California, to study, actually, uh, youth culture and all these things. This is not coming in 68, it's not an Imitation of, yes. of uh, you know, Berkeley. It is actually very deeply in This is when in institutes for the study of, of youth of uh, uh, appear are under the patronage exactly. of all the exactly. political exactly. Pa exactly. communist parties all over the place exactly. in Eastern Europe. And then I think there are two more uh, funny, funny things. I think uh, one is, is of course, uh, uh, the transfer of radical right left ideological cultures, which is, of course, we can also see that there is a. American trajectory and the Paris trajectory, but it's again much more complicated. I mean, like, of course, the Trotskyite then Gilasian local tradition is actually having a very strong impact. I mean, we know this, I mean, the Polish colleague who is not here now, but in, we had in Sinaya. I mean, there is a long story of, of, of the Polish ra radical leftist political discourse in the mid 60s. This is not uh, American. I, I would even say that it predates the American yes. uh, discussion. And this is actually using this uh, Gilasian discourse about bureaucracy of 
communism and actually uh, craves for some sort of uh, generational revolution and pluralization of the communist regime, but not restoring uh, bourgeois democracy, yes? not at all. And I think that also goes together and that you can see also in a very interesting way with the cult of the third world, which is a very uh, double-edged thing. On the one hand, it is an officially in used uh, consum consumified cult of you know Cuban revolutionary whatever, but it can very easily and very quickly turn against the regime. And I think uh, Gabor could tell even more than that I, I can tell. But like this is a very very interesting story if from the mid 60s onwards in the most of these countries. Uh, both Mao serves as a kind of possible critical uh, tool. I mean this is even more striking, and we have in Hungarian context, for example, Hungarian Maoists who are clearly coming from actually kids of communist bureaucracy who are actually rejecting their father's consumerist uh, communist uh, uh, kind of position and kind of craving for some true revolutionary whatever. This is not through America, this is through the Chinese embassy, which is distributing yes. uh, leaflets to them. And also there is a kind of a very interesting dynamics of actually supporting the Vietnamese against the Americans, so much so that the real politic East European political regimes freak out, yes? So the, actually the first demonstration in Hungary which is actually crushed by the police after 56, is not a liberal democratic march for restoring multi-party system. It's actually supporting the Vietnamese and going to the American embassy and shouting. Uh, but of course, everybody knew that this is kind of anti-authoritarian. It's not just about Vietnam and not just about America. And actually, the regime said that, well, we can tell you when you can go there to the embassy, but you don't dare go there spontaneously. And this is exactly the same story in Belgrade. Yes, I mean, actually, the Titoist regime, which is theoretically the kind of non aligned uh, country, which is actually having this very strong global south ideology, freaks out completely when the, the uh, students. So it's exactly parallel, completely parallel with the Rudy Duchka story with going against the Iran uh, uh, in, in West Berlin and kind of like be, being beaten up by the secret agents of the I Iran regime. This is actually performed completely locally, having nothing to do with the transfer of. Of Western patterns, this is very genuine, local, uh, uh, and I think then, then I would say a, a, a more general thing, and then I will say something about the political doctrines very shortly. Is that I think what binds all these things together, and I think that is very much fitting into the East Central European local tradition, is that since you never have or almost never have institutional politics, culture is by default political. So, so for for these contexts, counterculture is not something new. I mean, like after all, East Central European political culture is counterculture most of the time. Yes, I mean. You have, I mean, that's why when we wrote this history of 19th and 20th century political thought, so when we have 19th century, we don't have treatises about human constitutions or whatever. Like, okay, so there are some constitutions usually copied from Swiss and Belgian sources. What you have is poetry. Yes, what you have is basically, uh, uh, you know, cosmic cosmic dreams about universal harmony, and you have to extract from that the political discourse, because that's where politics is taking place, not in, uh, not in uh, uh, political normative uh, theories. And I, I think that's why, by the way, it's quite interesting what happens after 89 when there is an attempt to create political science that actually eliminate this kind of uh, alternative. Uh, uh, One of these issues is that uh, at the, the highest level of the public sphere, you keep encountering high culture. Exactly. where everything is exactly. defined and defines yeah. the context. Exactly. So, so problems and solutions are always translated exactly. into the vocabulary and to the imagery of high culture, yeah. which is something that never takes place in the, in the West after, let's say, the 1930s. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Whereas, the rupture is, yeah. exactly. whereas here uh, it went on. And, and I think I would just pull, and then, then really just three sentences about the political context, but I mean, just l let's think about this ambiguity, yes, that like basically the uh, American counterculture or canonization is done by the same foreman uh, with hair, who is actually uh, doing a very uh, different, but at the same time similar uh, 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 cinematography about youth problems in Czechoslovakia in the mid 60s. And he is shooting these films about like the famous concourse, like the famous film about how girls are trying to participate in the rock festival and they are actually performing their own self and it turns out that they don't have anything to perform and the regime doesn't have anything to perform. So, so what, what uh, uh, Foreman is actually doing is that he's intuitively actually translating these concepts not because he brings it from America actually, he will take certain things to America rather. But what is, what is there is a very interesting, very perceptive I think, analysis of how new types of cultural modalities and popular culture are somehow having this dialogue with this tradition of non-political politics. 
Yes, and, and I think this is I would like to stress that that I think if you want to have a specificity for East Central European political culture, then anti-politics or non-political politics is really a very strong tradition. And I think when you want to understand all these underground cultural phenomena and why they have such a weight and that, why is it possible that well that underground uh, uh, turns into uh, plastic people of the universe and plastic people of the universe turns into Charter 77, then it's only understandable if you take it from the perspective of this kind. Of, uh, counter counter uh, or anti-political tradition and now just to say really two sentences about the political uh, things i think uh, we try to build some sort of model of how is central european political uh, this is a project that uh, resulted in two massive volumes at oxford university press which uh, uh, bolas has edited over the last many years the second volume now was uh, given to the press will it will be out shortly the first is already in the bibliography as you can go and get it and read it so so what we try to do is basically to kind of write a analytical and non-national history of, of the region's political thought and i mean if i'm thinking about the 68 context i would like to say that i mean what is more or less true for all the contexts, but of course the proportions are very different is that in contrast to the western uh, 68 where, where really the main stake is this kind of what, what you are talking about in a way search for some sort of extra institutional happiness and search for some sort of spontaneity and uh, Critique authenticity. Of authenticity and critique of institutions and critique of liberal democracy and whatever. I mean, in East Central Europe, uh, we there was a tendency after '89 to say that we are the other side. We are the ones who are actually craving for liberal democracy. And like, of course, that was the moment when Václav Havel's debate with uh, the others was kind of put there. That Václav Havel already in '68 says that you know Dubček is actually a failure because we should actually, if we want real legitimacy for this regime, we have to have multi-party democracy and actually liberal democracy. Forget about uh, socialism in the human face. And then, of course, historically Havel seemed to be the winner in the 1990s. But I think now, as we know that this this victory might be quite perfect, we can look back in a more historical perspective. And I think what we can identify is a triangular relationship, a liberal democratic project, radical leftist project, and national project. And all three are present, but the proportions are different. And I, I think I would like to stress now the national. I mean, we tend to believe that 68 is kind of universal, is global, whatever. But if you look at most of the 68 movements in most of the Central European countries, and of course one extreme is Romania, where there is no liberal democracy and very little radical left, but there is a kind of national mobilization. But then this is pretty much the case in Slovakia, in Croatia, in Slovenia, in many other countries, typically in countries which are subaltern, yes, which are part of a kind of multinational or multi-ethnic federation, and they are actually con con uh, somehow converting their democratic project into some sort of national project. And I think, uh, on the other hand, I would like to also stress, especially because you don't have, we don't have the Czech colleague who was talking about this, that the, the left wing, the radical left wing story, is much stronger. Than we believe, yes. I mean, like a, a, a Czech, uh, a Czech context will be Egon Bondi is probably the most well known. I mean, he is actually a kind of very demonic and very interesting figure, secret agent for the STB, and at the same time, the most coherent critique, left wing critique of uh, the regime, very much on this Gilas Trotskyite. Uh, tradition, uh, but then you have also pretty much the same story in Hungary, in, in the Polish context with Michnik, and th these are of course very often not, not really meeting, so these three discourses can be actually three different subcultures, three, three different intellectual traditions, whatever, but then it's very interesting that after 68 they will start to meet, and actually very often this is the, I mean in Hungary in 68, 69, for example, that is a very nicely documented story, that the two groups, one of them are this kind of first generation rural guys coming from this folkish populist slightly anti-semitic anti-urban tradition and the kids of the jewish communist uh, uh, middle class uh, whatever who are kind of coming with different values different intellectual traditions different uh, sensitivities different fears in 68 69 they start to talk to each other and the jewish kids start to go to the countryside to these villages and participate in the dance house and these these rural guys start to actually read Lukács and and, and 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 philosophy and all that and the outcome of this will be actually this kind of reconfiguration in the 1970s in a new kind of underground which will be a kind of anti-political but much more political anti-political underground so this is where i was so. thank you very much one of the things that uh, 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 strikes the observer <clears throat> from 2018, looking back 50 years to, to, to 1968, is how much of all this diversity has been lost 
as it were, not only in translation when we talk about Eastern Europe to Western European colleagues, but also in the translation between the countries from the same area, since most of these um, uh, experience of the 1960s have been pretty much forgotten. In the case of uh, um, Czechoslovakia, which was mentioned by, by Bolas, our colleague from Prague, uh, Jan Mervat, was describing this phenomenon. It was not big. Uh, it was a group of uh, 60, 70 uh, people who were grouping around uh, this charismatic, uh, uh, very ingenious, uh, uh, innovative person who was doing all kinds of things in uh, uh, between all the trends, uh, political trends in Prague, trying to subvert communism from uh, the left, uh, coming up with a project of a radical left that would have solved most of the problems, he thought, of the, of the uh, regime in the... But this is news in Prague today, so uh, in Prague. Uh, even that has been uh, wiped out uh, from the meta-narrative of uh, political life, political ideas in, uh, in the Czech Republic, in Czechoslovakia, especially the Czech Republic, because the other side has won. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, uh, maybe in the foreseeable future, with second thoughts about what the winners of that uh, fight of 1968 has managed to produce, to generate, maybe there will be a kind of return to things that happened, were discussed, were forgotten. And, and then just to add one thing, because I think it's also very interesting, is that actually these guys get to prison, not because they are extreme left-wing, but because in 69, they are the first ones who are saying that, okay, we hate liberal democracy, but now we have to cooperate. Yeah. And I think this is probably also an interesting lesson for the contemporary new left uh, discussions that, like, you know, you have a moment when probably it's, it's that, and actually the regime freaks out because of that. So they wouldn't get to prison because of their fantasizing about Marx. They get to prison when they say that we are actually radical left, but we have to have a common platform yeah. to say whatever can be said. And that's when they are kind of put to prison. They are the first who will actually be put to prison. Okay, so this gives you a certain idea of our exchanges in, uh, in Sinai, which are based on papers and also on a convivial exchange of two, three days out there in the mountains, where surprisingly no, uh, right. the weather was great, so which would which would not, we would not anticipate. So now um, I will turn to Daniel Barbu and ask him to, now that you have uh, gotten a certain feeling of what has been uh, discussed in Sinai, to, to step in and then come with your... Uh... Yes, I'd like to not really to draw on a suggestion made by Professor Press, but uh, try to look at it is after to look at uh, counterculture as a cultural revolution, taking seriously Bob Dylan, times they are changing, what really changed. And uh, the countercultural aspects that have been discussed may be just a kind of iconic disguise for a uh, deeper trend. Some of the changes were obviously triggered by the countercultural ideology of 67, 69, but others were staged by the liberal middle class itself <coughs> using, <coughs> if I dare say, as an excuse, the events of 68 <coughs> to advance sometimes a post-liberal agenda or a suicidal liberal agenda in one particular respect I mentioned. And <clears throat> there will be simply three, there are many, but uh, very quickly I can think of three uh, phenomena that were, uh, have their origin in 67, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> 68, 69, 70, 71, and are uh, still ongoing as part of what I would uh, consider the most successful cultural revolution ever, as, as its origin in those particular years or in uh, the 
1968 precisely. First is uh, the uh, method acceleration of the pace of secularization. <coughs> if you think a, a country like Canada, and particularly Quebec, Easter 1968, churches were filled. The whole families, the whole village, the whole township was attending mass for Easter. One year later, no one showed up <laughs> for the midnight mass. So it's everywhere in Britain, in the Netherlands, in the Nordic country, <coughs> secularization somehow took advantage of 1968. But there is this particular country, the Quebec, where things are almost miraculous. In one year, in the span of one year, a very Roman Catholic apostolic country became a profoundly secular society. The second dimension, which is still ongoing and very significant, and somehow Eastern, Central Eastern Europe caught up after 18. 1989, <coughs> with this dimension is, to put it simply, the sexual revolution. That is, the uh, abandonment of what was the bourgeois convention of the 50s and early 60s about what the family should be, what the relations between men, women, and men, men, women, women should be. And if you look at Britain, for instance, <clears throat> in the span of three years, uh, the abortion law is repealed. Uh, Sunday is not the day of the Lord anymore, so you can open shop on Sundays. You can organize football matches on Sundays, which you couldn't do <coughs> before 1968. homosexual gay relations become acceptable and in the long run even are legalized in many uh, countries. Uh, uh, the fifth generation of rights, the right of the people that belong to sexual minorities, for instance, among other minorities, uh, are considered to quote President Obama in his second inaugural address are fundamental human rights. Now, and everything started in the immediate aftermath of 1968, and uh, thirdly, and that would concern all of us here at the table and some of the people listening to us, uh, the uh, illiberal reform of the university that took place in Europe and in North America also. That is, the uh, 1968 triggered indirectly, it's not a, a cause-effect relationship, but a more subtle one, triggered uh, the demise of liberal arts. All universities from Harvard via Oxford to uh, Lomonosov in Moscow, including our very modest Central European universities, now claim and the governments encourage them, the European Union authorities, the American Congress gives away money for the purpose of helping, educating the young generation to possess skills that would help them uh, find a job and be useful consumers and less importantly citizens of uh, today's societies. The all liberal idea that uh, higher education means knowledge based on uh, visiting old texts and being in dialogue with uh, thinkers that before us struggled with the fundamental topics of freedom, justice, and so on and so forth, was slowly abandoned in uh, all 
major and eventually smaller universities. Now it's not about universities, it's not about knowledge, it's about skills. It's about enabling graduates to have success on the labor market. The graduates themselves, their parents, or claim that, or why is that related? Not only chronologically, just someone may say just happened that after 1968 in Britain in 71, uh, in, uh, in the US before that in order to, uh, to dissolve the People's Republic of Berkeley, uh, private money were poured into uh, public universities and public money into private universities in order to have uh, both the control of big business and the government on how young Americans are educated. Uh, in France, in 71, also the complete reshuffling of the education, we see the break apart of the University of Paris in, I don't know, 11 universities, the creation of a university in uh, the uh, uh, all major cities around France in order to democratize, to uh, open the university for the working class offsprings. And it's not only chronology I, I tend to claim, uh, but it's uh, part of this anti-bourgeois message of the uh, counterculture of 1968. Uh, and uh, liberal arts are very bourgeois are related to an idea of the ideal citizen that was uh, framed in the, the late 18th century and all along the 19th century, uh, as opposed to uh, the popular classes which needed to work, to be present to, uh, on, on the labor market. So the universities abandoned uh, all uh, attachment to the old liberal arts as detached from real life, from the market, and from society. It's not only uh, a question of how the market itself uh, was instrumental in reshaping our universities, but also how a kind of ideology, a work, working class ideology, reshaped our universities in claiming that our graduates should be useful members of society, not learned members of society, as it was the case uh, beforehand, generically at least. So it is, there are many other uh, ways in which times did really change as, uh, Bob Dylan prophesies, uh, but it wasn't the work of but one generation, the generation which Dylan refers to in his song uh, and poem, but of all generations, including the bourgeois generation that to some extent I'm very, and Britain again, it's uh, a very uh, good case uh, in looking at who uh, uh, inspired uh, and implemented the reforms uh, related to the po post-68 uh, sexual revolution and which changed dramatically British society as uh, Dutch society was changed at about the same time or Swedish or Danish society. Uh, more slowly French and German society also changed later on Spanish and Italian societies and after 89 uh, in the same directions our Central European societies. So to my mind that would be uh, besides and beyond this uh, very picturesque image of uh, blue jeans, flower power, drugs and rock bands, uh, uh, Woodstock and everything that stirred my imagination a bit later I was
just 11 in 1968. So it's three, four years later that I came to discover Woodstock and Bob Dylan and wonder why Bob Dylan wasn't at Woodstock, why the doors were not invited and so on. So, and I, as a young t <laughs> teenager, I philosophized such important topics for me then. Uh, but besides and beyond that, what I think happened in 67, 69, in most Northwestern country, different things happened also. And Bola Stranger is absolutely right. Different things happened also in the same period, but they are rather related to other issues, to other outcomes. Also, the Cultural Revolution, the Romanian or even the Nationalist Cultural Revolution was triggered precisely in, not in May, but in August 1968 by a generation who took advantage of the hand that Ceausescu uh, was tending to uh, society as a whole in forgetting what happened four years before that is people getting out the prisons. So we are now rallying around the new flag of a uh, proud and independent nation that defies the Goliath, the Soviet Goliath, and so on, so on. So that gave, at least in Romania, for a generation that was born in the 40s and uh, early 50s, the chance of forgetting about the traumas of uh, 1945, 1964. But this is a different story, and Professor Fenchen knows uh, far more than. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel Barbu. Uh, I'll pick up just one last thing and then return to two more. Uh, the last thing is this uh, very interesting form of transnationality, which is the external intervention or the external threat. Mm -hmm. It had a pivotal role in the making of 1968. We talk, of course, in terms of a symbolic 1968, which can happen in 62 as well or in 71. Uh, but this symbolic conglomerate, the signifier 1968. Um, if you take Prague, the, the intervention of the Soviets, it had happened before in, in Budapest in 1956, of course, and we know how the external uh, threat and then the uh, in Soviet invasion was a form of radical transnationality uh, in the sense of modifying uh, 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 Hungarian society and the Hungarian political system beyond recognition. Uh, it became a completely different country in many respects. Then there is, and taming precisely that shock of 1956 has been the job of the next generation. And 1968 in Hungary cannot be easily explained without this uh, uh, process of domesticating the society and normalizing the Hungarian society after 1956. 58, 68 in, uh, in, uh, in Poland has uh, similar effects we know about the situation in, Pol in the, the Czech in Czechoslovakia, which is in Romania. To just pick up on this, what Daniel Barbo said. Very interestingly, the the, the presence of this external threat uh, of the Soviet invasion, of the imminent Soviet invasion, uh, brought back, uh, and I, I would say, uh, <coughs> sanctioned. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, finally uh, led to the success of this kind of revanche of the far right of the 1930s, which was now a legitimate partner in the remaking of the Romanian society of the 1968. All these people coming out of prisons are winning this cultural war that is being waged out there in society. They are contributing to the uh, new version of National Socialism, uh, or commun National Communism, that was put in place by... Uh, so, the Soviets didn't have to come to, you know, to take the trouble to come to Romania, but the threat of the Soviet invasion uh, was used very shrewdly by uh, uh, Ceausescu and his regime to uh, pacify their society, uh, while in the same time, all over the place, that was mentioned, and I would like to remember, to remind us uh, of this, uh, 
a kind of communist uh, frigidaire socialism or kind of consumer society was pretty much uh, moving up. Now, secularization and this uh, uh, rebirth of nationalism and, and of interwar anti-modernism after 1968. It was, uh, uh, I would say, it, it ran its course up until 1989, and now I think we see a re-enchantment, uh, as it were, of, of these Eastern Central European societies in a very, uh, to, you know, to a very serious extent, with religion in the form of, in the form of popular piety, but also in the form of fundamentalist uh, reaffirmation uh, of religiosity by both national churches and weak states that need the support of the church. And this leads to a reconfiguration of the, of the public spirit to the point of uh, uh, prefacing a return to yet another form of the liberalism, which is a conservative, a new form of conservative politics that we can see being deployed uh, all around our societies and countries in Central and Eastern Europe, irrespective of the name of the party or of the, uh, you know, of the official uh, program of the party. Uh, this kind of conservative uh, remaking of uh, Central Eastern Europe has something to do with this process that was started at the time. Well, just one little point about universities. <laughs> the, the sad thing is now that, of course, humanities have more or less disappeared too bad. And then it's all about skills. But this thing that started in universities has reached kindergarten now. <laughs> I mean, they start with learning skills before learning the alphabet or instead of learning to read and write. So that's, <laughs> I think... Uh, it's symbolic in, I believe it was April 68 when the students of Tübingen went out in the street to protest and rally their colleagues in France and in other German cities. They had a particular claim and they were students of letters and humanity to stop studying Latin. Yes. Latin is a dead language. We don't need Latin. In one of the most important universities in the world in the study of classics. That was the foremost uh, requirement of the students with respect. Well, they, they won, they won. The uh, presidency of the university. <laughs> they won. Now I, I will turn to Bogdan Guiou, and uh, he will speak French, uh, has followed the conversation, and he will speak French. Now, this will probably catch the attention of our <laughs> other uh, friend and guest tonight, Izzy Morgenstern, who comes from Paris. Uh, 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 a documentary film by Izzy Morgenstern will be shown uh, on uh, the 26th of, uh, that is on Tuesday, at the French Cultural Institute, starting from 4.30. It's a, it's a documentary on Benny Lévy, one of the leaders of the uh, Maoist uh, uh, intellectual uh, uh, youth movement in, in Paris in 1968. And uh, you are all uh, kindly invited, should you, would li should you like to, to come and uh, see the film itself. And then the debate afterwards, which I will join after the projection of the film, because on the 26th, I do something else here before. So I turn to, to Bogdan. Bogdan. Allez. Bah oui, je m'excuse, mais je parle mieux français que l'anglais. Donc vous avez parlé, je reprends là où vous avez laissé apporter les choses, au, au cas roumain. Parce que là, on avait une double opposition. Donc c'était l'opposition au pouvoir. Là. En fait, euh, là, quand tu disais l'invasion de la Tchécoslovaquie par les Russes, c'était, par les Soviétiques, c'était en fait. Les soviétiques, c'était comme la police sur, dans les campus universitaires. Donc c'était une réinvasion, une reprise de pouvoir euh, dans ce qu'ils contrôlaient déjà, soi-disant. Bon, donc euh, pour euh, mettre une, une, euh, une analogie, donc euh, le refus d'invasion, de faire de la police de la part de Ceausescu a, démo, a, a créé une confusion entre deux, euh, deux strates de couches. Euh, d'opposition l'opposition à la politique parce que ce qu'on 
ce qu'on peut, qu'on ligne qui unifie tout ça, c'est euh, l'Est et l'Ouest, et la, cette pluralité, comme tu disais, le conglomérat, euh, que, que, ça, que la seule unité, c'est la génération. C'est une unité générationnelle. Donc, euh, euh, qui voulait non pas cons consommer, cons faire de la consommation, mais être acteur. Donc, ils, ils étaient déjà dans, dans l'image. Ils étaient, c'était déjà du, bon, c'est un peu d'anachronie, c'était déjà du selfie, quoi. Et on, on faisait un peu, euh, il y avait cette, euh, ce printemps, une grande expo à la faculté de, de Beaux-Arts à Paris, sur la mémoire des euh, les, les images en lutte. Et là, c'était un quartier général, ça montrait d'où venait tout ces, la production, cette production d'images, de jeux de mots, euh, et ça se produisait là, c'était le quartier. Euh, général, euh, dans toutes les directions. Euh, donc, euh, cette esthétisation de la lutte, euh, c'est déjà euh, un fait. C'était une lutte politique, une contre-lutte politique, et euh, ce qui relie euh, ça, c'est l'extériorité du pouvoir. Le mot, le mot, le maître mot de, de cette, de, de, so, de 68 en général, je pense que c'est la répression. Après, c'est devenu domination, voilà, pouvoir et répression, mais l'État, c'est l'extérieur, c'est l'autre. C'est extérieur, c'est pas nous. Donc, on s'affirme d'une manière non politique, pas seulement non bourgeoise, non politique, extra politique, on fait autrement de la politique, euh, même si on fait pas de la politique. Mais en Roumanie, bon, c'était déjà l'opposition au pouvoir, quoi, parce qu'il y avait cette énorme couche de, de communication que vous avez très bien décrite euh, entre les pays de, de l'Est, entre ce que se passait aux États-Unis, à Paris, dans toute l'Europe. Donc cette forme, cette invention de forme de gauche alternative en même temps, c'était une gauche non salinienne, non au pouvoir. Donc comment faire de la gauche qu'elle qu ne soit plus au pouvoir Parce que eh, ici, euh, ça crée cette double, cette double, je pensais à la... Parce que, euh, si vous, on se rappelle, à l'époque, c'était quoi C'était le rock, le rock roumain, c'était avec des influences du substrat. C'était pas, c'était sous-chrétien. Donc, il y avait, bon, on peut jouer avec des mots, c'était doublement underground. C'était le, le substrat culturel, c'était pas la religion au pouvoir. Si on passe à Phoenix, à, 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 à Florian, à, 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 Oui, c'était du, voilà, c'était le sub substrat. Un peu fantasmé, bon, c'est pas très attesté, c'est difficile à attester euh, historiquement. Euh... Fais gaffe. Oui, oui, oui. ok. Ouais, mais on ouais. est patriote. Là. Non, oui, oui. Mais non, mais <rire> sous patriote. <quoi. rire> voilà. Et donc, euh, à la fois, c'était du rock et du doublement euh, underground. Mais euh, par le refus d'invasion, de faire de la police en Tchécoslovaquie, de participer à cette force de réinvasion, en fait, c'était ça, c'était une réoccupation, euh, une réaffirmation de pouvoir qui a laissé faire, comme ça, avait délégué le pouvoir local, donc bah, bon, on va le, reprendre le pouvoir, euh, il a, ça a été créé un mélange, parce qu'il y avait ce strat, ce, cette couche d'opposition internationaliste, disons, de gauche alternative, qui hein, et une nouvelle opposition... Que faire de cette opposition au pouvoir officiel, opposition officielle euh, du jeune C'était toujours une, un truc générationnel aussi, parce que c'était quand même un jeune, euh, un jeune dirigeant euh, qui, a, <rire> qui, qui essayait d'imaginer une, une sorte de euh, d'entre deux comme ça, qui a pour le moment ça, ça a marché, ça donnait l'illusion que ça pourrait fonctionner. Donc euh, c'est cela que je bon je vais pas me euh, me rallonger trop euh, cette idée de d'extériorité du pouvoir parce que ici euh, après ben, je je devrais peut-être faire une, une sorte d'anamnèse d'introspection euh, objectif en tant que membre de ma génération poétique parce que tu sais très bien euh, mes collègues surtout il y avait tout cet imaginaire de la génération 80 qui était une très mélangée c'était pas du tout euh, nationaliste donc il fallait on avait deux fonds il, 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 on était entre les deux fonds entre l'opposition au pouvoir et le pouvoir 
donc, il y a cet imaginaire, dont on imaginait, on parlait en, en termes d'autoroute, de, de consommation, d'image. Euh, ouais, le, le premier volume de Mieux Chakrater s'appelait « Des phares vitrines et photographies ». Des phares, vitrine c'est que c'est du bourré, quoi. Euh, du, du, des phares, des vitrines et des photos. Des photos. Voilà, c'est que des images, des reflets, tout ça. C'est le début d'un des plus connus, euh, peut-être le plus connu écrivain de ma... Euh, de ma gestion, à l'époque euh, un, un très bon poète, maintenant trois acteurs, mais ça reste il reste un grand poète euh, donc on était entre les entre les deux imaginaires parce que déjà euh, c'était ce qu'on a dit euh, le pouvoir avait repris cette identité euh, nationaliste euh, qui peut-être pourrait nous dire quelque chose sur la, la grosse métamorphose de, de 68 maintenant. Pourquoi les anciens maintenant Là, c'était plus en plus plus condensé chez nous. Mais si on regarde ce qui était bon, si, si on parlait de la, la description historique de, de Orban, par exemple, qui était un antitotalitaire qui est devenu identitaire. Donc euh, là, nous, on l'a vécu un peu plus euh, euh, plus condensé. Euh, il, il, il est peut-être le temps de, de faire une euh, anamnèse qui pourrait nous aider à comprendre aussi d'autres euh, phénomènes. En bref, euh, c'est ça. <rire> D'accord. Merci Bogdan. Oui, euh, je, je vais euh, non, quand même répondre à l'anglais. Oui, je suis d'accord. Il y a bien sûr a certain exteriority of power, uh, everybody perceived that. There was no place for the young generation in the, powers, in the power system. Um, but in the same time, uh, the system was still trying not only to study the young generation, which they were doing systematically, but also to allow younger cadre to get into the system in in the vain hope of not necessarily humanizing socialism in any way, but uh, helping it to survive. So uh, it's a very interesting thing in the 1960s, which is, ends abruptly at the end of the 1970s in Romania. The interest of the uh, party state to identify uh, intelligent, yeah. uh, competent uh, young persons promote them irrespective of their family background, which before had played an enormous role in the promotion and affirmation of specialists. And now the idea was to identify them, promote them, uh, um, flesh up the, uh, yes, the, the cadre, the new generation that was needed for the modernization project of the, uh, of, of the party state. And one can very easily identify uh, in the, night, the late 1970s, the end. So in about 10 years or so, the whole project was completely abandoned. Modernization, and I will say also neo-modernity, which was at the time the main cultural form of, uh, the main form of uh, culture in Romania, was sidetracked. Then, and to the forefront came these elements of neo-paganism and national identity, fictitious, in fact, pre-national identity, tribal, imaginary tribal identity, which uh, came back in a very uh, virulent form to become the official ideology. And uh, the abandoning the project of modernization, altogether with neo-modernity, with modernity and neo-modernism, paved the way for the coming back uh, in uh, already in the 1980s, of both forms of fundamentalist uh, religiosity, among the cultivated, among the elites. In fact, it's very interesting that they started it. It's not the popular. Yeah. The popular piety in Romania in the 1980s existed, but not, did not exist at the same level that we we see here. It was uh, an elite phenomenon. People who are uh, joining this kind of uh, uh, anti-modernist spirituality, which was coming close to new age in many ways, was revisiting local traditions. 
And this is when I think a new uh, social identity was produced almost exclusively on the basis of, a national, of an imaginary national identity. And from then on, I think uh, uh, the social agenda almost totally disappeared from politics. And to this present day, uh, people who demonstrate in the streets of Bucharest simply do not care about this, uh, any kind of social agenda, such as, for instance, the social solidarity, uh, social protection of any form, or uh, uh, the fairness in terms of legislation at the place of work, and so forth. So it's a social agenda which is was uh, highlighted in 1968, and the ruins of that have been aesthetic for a while, and then have become national and then ultimately conservative. So if I were to, to wrap this up, we are just offering you some samples of our discussion over two, three days, uh, which we hope to continue on, uh, on another occasion. Um, I would say that uh, many things have changed uh, in these 50 years. The easiest uh, thing to identify is that sometimes the transformation between the positive and the negative were the movement of persons, of ideas, of fragments of society from the radical left to the radical right. This is the easiest thing. Somebody who was a radical leftist in, the, in 1968 comes back uh, today in the, in, the, in the form of a right winger. Uh, so, some didn't need 50 years for that. They did it quickly, more quickly, but around let's say 1989, mm -hmm. this transformation was all more, almost occurred in most of the countries in Central and Eastern Europe, and of course also in Western Europe. Things that were, uh, I, I gave examples in, uh, in Sinaia, of people who couldn't possibly imagine a dialogue uh, in France. I gave some examples from France. People who could, would never see each other, would take the guts of each other in 1968, being on the exact opposite uh, uh, corners of that. Now they have uh, met and uh, guess what is the political and almost metaphysical space where they meet? Deep conservatism, uh, which is as illiberal as their uh, youthful uh, leftism was. And that is a, a very interesting transformation in 50 years, I have to say. Quite sad, I would also add to that. Now, um, I, we can still take some uh, uh, questions or comments uh, from the floor. Is he, est-ce que vous voulez dire quelque chose? Do you want to say anything, inter interject? Right? Yeah. I'm very sorry, you said that it's not a special. No, come, come here because they, uh, I want to have a little more on camera. Yeah. Okay. Um, what would be short is going to be filmed and after that. No. <laughs> yeah. uh, he's also a maker of films and uh, he's reticent when he is invited over there. Oh, well. yeah. Just uh, I told the rest of the colloquium about comfort culture. I have nothing to say because mainly the major trends, you know, came from the States and before uh, 68. And from 68 to 73, uh, I have to say that I was there. And I, was, uh, I used to see all these things. Uh, the main discussion from 68 to 73 was Marxism. Marxism, it took five years to die completely. Gaullism, a year. Uh, the old world, uh, which was the main problem, uh, and uh, the way to freedom, uh, why till 73? Because 73, there was uh, this huge demonstration in Arzak. And it was the beginning of ecology, which was completely new uh, in the political uh, uh, discussions. And uh, for uh, a Marxist group to, uh, to support uh, farmers who want their own land, it was very, very strange. I remember very strange. And that's 73. And let's say I check it during your, uh, your lecture. I check it. Uh, the huge concert organized by the Trotskyist, Lutubriel, 
it's 72 with the groups coming from uh, the USA. Captain Bifat, if you know the groups. And, but before not, in the uh, La Fête de l'Humanité, in the Humanity Feast, it was very classical singers till 73, 75, 76. It took some years. It was not uh, so fast. And it turns to, that's uh, uh, the only thing I may say, because it's a testimony. It turns to uh, a counterculture uh, slowly. And it came not from 68, I'm sorry to say that, but from the States, from uh, uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco. Uh, the only thing we have in 68 is Danny Cohn-Bendy and freedom, and saying that Trotskyist is not, Marxism is not a solution. And uh, on the other hand, uh, they have, we have to destroy democracy, the pouvoir dans la rue, power is in the street, but that took many years, but now it's okay. Democracy is uh, instant democracy for a few years, but it took, uh, let's say, 50 years, 48 years. To finish with democracy, if he, he, he made that the first day, I have even stories to tell, but it's not, I have no time for the story. But I was in Nanterre. How can a generation be at the good, right place, not studying, but that was a place to, uh, I was a student there. And he decided to have a meeting to uh, how to go further. And he, he, make, he made a group with a person. He said, I'm going to say that and that, and we are going to have a decision for the uh, six, seven hundred person in the university meeting together to go on with a strike. And after 10 minutes, it was very clear that we are not going to have this decision. The professor didn't agree. He took the microphone and said exactly the contrary. He made, he made something <laughs> very funny, very funny, very clever. He says there is here a person, he didn't give his name, a person which is a, a neo-Nazi, and all the time he's here, we are impossible to go on. Everybody was asking what's going on there, but he destroyed completely the, the, uh, uh, this uh, uh, assembly for this person. The end of democracy, the end of uh, Marxism, the end of, uh, of uh, uh, Gaulism, that's clear. And the counterculture, slowly, coming from the States. That's, I'm sorry, my point of view. And the film I made it was about a very curious and small group, Maoist, not dealing, not with counterculture, not with music. They were never going to any concert, not reading other books than Maoist group, uh, books, uh, not Marxist. They were not Marxist. And, uh, and in 73, they decided to finish. And they closed the, uh, uh, the place, and they said, we have nothing more to do, and you have to go back at home. They were ready for fighting with guns and everything. It's probably one of the reasons they decided to, to finish, not to go to be terrorists. That's all. That's, uh, thank you for asking some other, me. Yes, thank you. No, whereas okay. some other people who had been in the same movement decided to move on, to use guns and to go to oh, political very few, terrorism. Uh, 30 persons. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. In Germany. A very small group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One group, not yeah. two. Yeah, yeah. It was very easy to catch them. Yes, yes. For the police. One group and no more. Uh, action direct. That's the only one. They killed person. They killed. Uh, uh, their job was to kill. But uh, it's a pity to say, but uh, not enough. Uh, well, uh, five, ten persons. Uh, no. <laughs> Victory. They're not ready for the bigger thing. Yes, okay. Then thank you very much. I think we could thank you. wrap it up here because the we can we will continue the discussion informally uh, immediately in two, three, four minutes uh, and over a glass of wine, yes. Yes, where, where, while uh, others are uh, everywhere else, we'll have this uh, glass of wine together.
Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the small audience and to the audience out there in the uh, on, online. We hope there will be many to, to the see sky. us in the future. In, <laughs> out there in the sky. Let me uh, let me formulate this kind of cosmic uh, code that, or cosmological code that out there there are lots of people watching. So thank you very much, and I'll see you on the other side. Now we have a glass of wine or something. <laughs>